because it wants to replace this closed source firmware with an open Linux boot version. And our next speaker, Tramel Hudson, he's an integral part of that project. And he's here to provide you an overview of this Linux boot project. Thank you very much. And please give a warm round of applause to Tramel Hudson, please. Thank you. Securing the boot process is really fundamental to having uh, secure systems because of the uh, the vulnerabilities in firmware can affect any uh, security that the operating system tries to provide. And for that reason, I think it's really important that we replace the proprietary vendor firmwares with open source like Linux. And this is not a new idea. My collaborator, Ron Minnick, started a project called Linux BIOS back in the 90s when he was at Los Alamos National Labs. They built the world's uh, third fastest supercomputer out of a Linux cluster that used BIOS in the ROM to make it more reliable. Linux BIOS turned into core boot uh, some in 2005, and the Linux part was removed, and it became a generic bootloader. And it now powers the Chromebooks, as well as projects like the Head's slightly more secure laptop firmware that I presented last year at CCC. Unfortunately, it doesn't support any server mainboards anymore. Most servers are running the, a variant of Intel's UEFI firmware, which is a project that, that Intel started to replace the somewhat aging 16-bit uh, real mode BIOS of the, the 80s and 90s. And like a lot of second systems, it's pretty complicated. If you've been to any talks on firmware security, you've probably seen this slide before. It goes through multiple phases as the uh, system boots. The first phase does a cryptographic verification of the, uh, the pre-EFI phase. This, the PEI phase is responsible for bringing up the memory controller, the CPU interconnect, and a few other critical devices. It also enables paging in long mode and then jumps into the, uh, the device execution environment, or Dixie phase. This is where UEFI option ROMs are executed, as well as all of the remaining devices are initialized. Once the PCI bus and USB buses have been walked and enumerated, it transfers to the boot device selection phase, which figures out which disk or stick, USB stick or network uh, to boot from. That loads a bootloader from that device, which eventually loads a real operating system, which than is the operating system that's running on the machine. What we're proposing is that we replace all of this with the Linux boot uh, kernel and runtime. We can do all of the device enumeration in Linux. It already has support for doing this. And then we can use more sophisticated protocols and tools to locate the real kernel that we want to run and use the kexec system call to be able to start that new kernel. And the reason we want to use Linux here is because it gives us the ability to have a, a more secure system. It gives us a lot more flexibility. And hopefully, it lets us create a more resilient uh, system out of it. On the security front, one of the, the big areas that we, we get some benefit is we reduce the attack surface. That in the Dixie phase, these drivers are an enormous amount of code. On the Intel S2600, there are over 400 modules that get loaded. They do things like the option ROMs that I mentioned. And if you want an example of how dangerous option ROMs can be, you can look at my Thunderstrike talks from a few years ago. They also do things like display the, uh, the, the boot splash, the vendor logo. And this has been a place where quite a few buffer overflows have been found in vendor firmwares in the past. They have a complete network stack 
IPv4 and v6, as well as uh, HTTP and HTTPS. They have legacy device drivers for things like floppy drives. And again, these sort of dusty corners are where vulnerabilities in Zen have been found that allowed uh, hypervisor break. There are also modules that the Microsoft OEM activation that we just don't know what they do. Or things like a Y2K rollover module that probably hasn't been tested in two decades. So the final OS bootloader phase is actually not part of UEFI, but it's typically, in the Linux system, it's GRUB, the Grand Unified Bootloader. And you all, many of you are probably familiar with its, its interface, but did you know that it has its own file system, video, and network drivers? About uh, almost 250,000 lines of code uh, make up GRUB. I don't bring up the size of this to complain about the space it takes, but because of how much it increases our attack surface. You might think that having three different operating systems involved in this boot process gives us a defense in depth, but I would argue that we are subject to the weakest link in this chain, because if you can compromise UEFI, you can compromise Grub, and if you can compromise Grub, you can compromise the Linux kernel that you want to run on the machine. So, and there are lots of ways these attacks could be launched. As I mentioned, UEFI has a network device driver. Grub has a network device driver. And of course, Linux has a network device driver. This means that a remote attacker could potentially get code execution during the boot process. UEFI has a FAT file system driver. Excuse me, has a USB uh, driver. Grub has a USB driver. And of course, Linux has a USB driver. There have been bugs found in USB stacks, which unfortunately are, are very complex, and a buffer overflow in a USB descriptor handler could allow a local attacker to plug in a rogue device and take control of the firmware during the boot. Of course, UEFI has a FAT driver, Grub has a FAT driver, Linux has a FAT driver. This gives an attacker a place to gain persistence and perhaps uh, leverage code execution during the, uh, the initial file system or partition walk. So what we argue is that we should have the operating system that has the most contributors and the most code review and the, the most frequent update schedule for these roles. Uh, Linux has a lot more eyes on it. It undergoes a much more rapid uh, update schedule than pr pretty much any vendor firmware. You might ask, why do we keep the, the PEI and the SEC phase from the UEFI firmware? Couldn't we use core boot in, in this place? And the problem is that vendors are not documenting the memory controller or the CPU interconnect. Instead, they're providing a opaque binary blob called the firmware support package, or FSP, that does the memory controller and the uh, CPU initialization. On most, core, on most core boot systems, on most modern core boot systems, core boot actually calls into the FSP to do this initialization. And on a lot of the devices, the FSP has grown in scope, so it now includes video device drivers and power management. And it's actually larger than the PEI phase on some of the servers that we're dealing with. The other uh, wrinkle is that most modern CPUs don't uh, come out of reset into the legacy reset vector anymore. Instead, they execute an authenticated code module called BootGuard that's signed by Intel. And the CPU will not, will not uh, start up if that's not present. The good news is that this BootGuard ACM measures the PEI phase into the TPM, which allows us to detect uh, attempts to modify it uh, from malicious attacks. The bad news is that we are not able to change it on many of these systems. But even with that in place, we still have a much, much more flexible system. If you've ever worked with the UEFI shell or with uh, Grub's menu and config, it's really not, uh, it's not as flexible and the tooling is not anywhere near as mature as being able to write things with shell scripts or with Go or with real languages. Additionally, we can configure the Linux boot kernel with the standard uh, Linux config tools. 
UEFI supports booting from that file systems, but with Linux boot, we can boot from any of the hundreds of file systems that Linux supports. We can boot from encrypted file systems since we have uh, Lux and uh, Crypt set up. Most UEFI firmwares can only boot from the network device that is installed on the server motherboard. We can boot from any network device that Linux supports, and we can use proper protocols. We're not limited to Pixie and TFTP. We can use SSL. We can do cryptographic measurements of, of the kernels that we receive. And the runtime that makes up Linux boot is also very flexible. Uh, last year, I presented the heads runtime for laptops. And this is a very security-focused uh, uh, initial RAM disk that uh, attempts to provide a slightly more secure, measured, and attested uh, firmware. And this works really well with Linux boot. My collaborator, Ron Minnick, is working on a Go-based uh, firmware called Nerf. And this is written entirely in just-in-time compiled Go which is really nice because it gives you memory safety and is very popular inside of Google. Being able to tailor the device drivers that are included also allows the system to boot much faster. UEFI on the Open Compute Winterfell takes about eight minutes to start up. With, uh, Nerf, excuse me, with, uh, with Linux boot and Nerf, it starts up in about 20 seconds. I found similar results on the Intel mainboard that I'm working on, and it, hopefully we'll get a video of this in action. This is from power on uh, to execute the PEI phase uh, out of the ROM, and then jumps into a small wrapper around the Linux kernel, which then prints to the serial port. And we now have uh, the Linux print case. And we have an interactive shell in about 20 seconds, which is quite a bit better than the four minutes that the system used to take. It scrolled by pretty fast, but you might, you might have noticed that the print case says it, that the Linux kernel thinks it's running under EFI. That's because we have a small wrapper around the kernel. But for the most part, the kernel is able to do all of the PCI and uh, device enumeration that it needs to do, because it already does it since it doesn't trust the vendor BIOSes in a lot of cases. So I'm really glad that the Congress has added a track on uh, technical resiliency. Uh, and I, I would encourage Congress to also add a track on resiliency of our social systems, because it's really vital that we uh, deal with both online and offline harassment. And I think that that will help us make a safer and more secure uh, Congress as well. So last year, when I presented heads, I proposed three criteria for a resilient uh, technical system, that they need to be built with open source software, they need to be reproducibly built, and they need to be measured into some sort of cryptographic hardware. The open is, you know, I think for this crowd is, is not controversial. But the reason that we need it is because a lot of the server vendors don't actually control their own firmware. They license it from independent BIOS vendors who then uh, tailor it for whatever current model of uh, machine the, the uh, manufacturer is making. This means that they typically don't support older hardware. And if there are vulnerabilities, it's necessary that we be able to make these patches on our own schedule. And we need to be able to self-help when it comes to, to our own security. The other problem is that closed source systems can hide vulnerabilities for decades. This is especially true for very privileged devices like the management engine. And there have been several talks here at Congress about uh, the concerns that we have with the management engine. Some vendors are even violating our trust entirely and using, the firm, using their place in the, in the firmware to launch uh, install malware or adware onto uh, the systems. So for this reason, we really need our own, uh, our, our own control over this firmware. Reproducibility is becoming a much more of an issue. And the goal here is to be able to ensure that everyone who builds the Linux boot firmware gets exactly the same result that everyone else does. 
This is a requirement to be able to ensure that we're not introducing vul accidental vulnerabilities through picking up the wrong library or intentional ones through compiler supply chain attacks, such as uh, Ken Thompson's Trust in Trust article. With the Linux boot firmware, our kernel and initial and RD are reproducibly built, so we get exactly the same hashes uh, on, on the, the firmware. Unfortunately, we don't control the UEFI portions that we're using, the, the PEI and the SEC phase, so those aren't included in our, in our reproducibility right now. Measured is a, an, another place where we need to take into account uh, the, the runtime security of the system. So reproducible builds handle the compile time, but measuring what's running into cryptographic coprocessors like the TPM give us the ability to uh, make attestations as to what is actually running on the system. On the heads firmware, we do this to the user, that the firmware can, uh, can produce a one-time secret that you can compare against your phone to know that it has not been tampered with. In the server case, it uses remote attestation to be able to prove to the user that the code that is running is what they expect. This is a collaboration with the Mass Open Cloud project out of uh, Boston University and MIT that is attempting to provide a hardware root of trust for the servers so that you can know that a cloud uh, provider has not tampered with uh, your system. The TPM is not invulnerable, as uh, Chris Tronofsky showed at DEF CON, but the level of effort that it takes to break into a TPM, to decap it, and to read out the bits with the microscope raises the bar really significantly. And part of resiliency is making uh, honest trade-offs about security threats versus uh, the difficulty in launching the attacks. And if the TPM pre prevents remote attacks or prevents software-only attacks, that is a sufficiently high bar for a lot of these applications. We have quite a bit of ongoing research with this. Um, as I mentioned, the management engine is an area of great concern. And we are working on figuring out how to remove most of its capabilities so that it's not able to interfere with the running system. There's another device in, this, in most server motherboards called the Board Management Controller, or the BMC, that has a similar level of access to memory and devices. So we're concerned about what's running on there. And there's a project out of Facebook called OpenBMC that is a open source Linux distribution to run on that coprocessor. And what Facebook has done through the Open Compute Initiative is they have their OEMs pre-installing that on the, uh, the, the new Open Compute uh, uh, nodes, switches, and storage systems. And this is really where we need to get with uh, Linux boot as well. Right now, it requires physical access to the spy flash and the hardware programmer to be able to install. That's not a hurdle for everyone, but this is not something that we want people to be doing uh, in their server rooms. We want OEMs to be providing these systems that are secure by default so that it's not necessary to uh, break out your, your uh, chip clip to make this happen. But if you do want to contribute, right now we support three different main boards, the uh, Intel S2600, which is a modern Wolf Pass CPU. The uh, Mass Open Cloud is working with the Dell R630, which is a uh, Haswell, I believe. And then Ron Menick and uh, Jean-Marie are working on the Open Compute hardware. And this is, again, a, uh, uh, in conjunction with OpenBMC, a real potential for having free software in our firmware again. So if you'd like more info, we have a website. There's uh, some install instructions. Um, and we'd love to uh, help you build uh, more secure, more flexible, and more resilient systems. And I really want to thank everyone for coming here today. And I'd love to answer any questions that you might have.
Thank you very much, Shemel Hudson, for this talk. We have 10 minutes for Q&A, so please line up at the microphones if you have any questions, but there are no questions from the Signal Angel and the internet, so please, microphone number one. Uh, Sorry, uh, one quick question. Is 2 Sigma using this for any of their internal systems? And B, how much uh, vendor outreach is in there to try and make this beyond just the open compute, but also a lot of the vendors that were on your slides to adopt this? So currently, currently we don't have any deployed systems uh, taking advantage of it. Uh, it's still very much at the research stage. Uh, I've been spending quite a bit of time visiting OEMs, and one of my goals for 2018 is to have a, uh, a mainstream OEM ship in it. Um, the HEDS project is shipping firmware on, uh, on some laptops from, uh, from Librem, and I'm hoping that we can get Linux boot on servers as well. Microphone number two, please. Um, the, question, the question I have is about the size of uh, Linux. So you mentioned that there's problems with UFI, um, and it's not open source and stuff like that. But the issue uh, you mentioned there is that the, the main part of UFI is EDK, which is open source. And then, um, I mean, I just have to guess that the HTTP client and stuff that they have in, in the Apple boot, I assume it was, is for downloading their firmware. But how is replacing something that's huge with something that's even bigger uh, going to make the thing more secure? Because I think the, the whole point of having a security kernel is to have it really small to be verifiable. And I don't see that happening with uh, Linux because at the same time people are coming up with other things. I don't remember the, the other hypervisor, which is supposed to be better than KVM because KVM is not really verifiable. So that, that's a great question. That the, uh, the concern is that Linux is a huge uh, TCB, a trusted computing base. And that, that is a big concern. Uh, one, since we're already running Linux on the server, it essentially is inside our TCB already. So it's, uh, it is large, it is difficult to verify. Uh, however, the lessons that we've learned in porting Linux to run in this environment make it also very uh, conceivable that we could build other uh, systems. If you want to use a certified, excuse me, a um, uh, verified uh, microkernel, that would be a great place to bring into, um, uh, into the, the firmware. Um, and I'd love to figure out some way to, to make that happen. Um, the, uh, the second question, just to uh, point out that even though EDK2, which is the open source components of UEFI, um, are open source, there's a huge amount of closed source that goes into building a, uh, a UEFI firmware. And we can't verify the closed source part. And even the open source parts don't have the level of uh, inspection and um, uh, correctness that the Linux kernel has gone through and, and the Linux uh, systems that are exposed on the internet. Uh, most of the UEFI development is not focused on uh, that level of defense that, that Linux has to deal with every day. Microphone number two, please. Uh, thank you for the talk. Would it be possible also to support, uh, uh, apart from servers, uh, uh, to support laptops, uh, especially the one locked down by BootGuard? So the issue with uh, BootGuard on laptops is that the CPU fuses are typically set in what's called verified boot mode. And that will not exit the BootGuard ACM if the uh, firmware does not match the manufacturer's hash. So this doesn't give us any way to, take to, to circumvent that. Most server chipsets are set in what's called measured boot mode. So the BootGuard ACM just uh, measures the next stage into the TPM and then, and then jumps into it. So if an attacker has modified the firmware, you would be able to detect it during the attestation phase. Microphone number one, please. Just one question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on ARM, it's very, it's much faster to boot something. 
Um, but it's, it's also much simpler. You have an address, you load the bin file, and it boots. Uh, on x86, it's much more complex, and the amount of codes uh, you saw with, for Grub uh, relates to that. Uh, so my question, I've seen all the boards, uh, Cortex-A8 uh, booting in four seconds um, just to get a shell, uh, and six seconds to get a Qt, uh, so the Linux kernel played the Qt app to do a dashboard for a car, uh, so five to six seconds. So I'm wondering why is there such a big difference uh, for a server to, to to take 20 or 22 seconds? Is it the peripherals that needs to be um, initialized, or what's the reason for it? So there are several things that contribute to the 20 seconds, and one of the things that we're looking into is trying to profile that. Um, we're able to swap out the PEI core and turn on a lot of debugging, and what I've seen on, uh, on the Dell system, a lot of that time is spent waiting for the management engine to come online, and then there's also, it appears to be a one second timeout for every CPU in the system that uh, they, you know, that, that they bring the CPUs on in lo one at a time, and it takes almost precisely, you know, one million microseconds for each one. So there are things in the vendor firmware that we currently don't have the ability to change, that appear to be the uh, the, the long tent and, and excuse me, the long pole in the tent on on the boot process. Microphone three in the back, please. You addressed a lot about security, um, but my question is rather there's a lot of settings, for example, BIOS, there's uh, UEFA settings, and there's stuff like remote booting, which is a whole bunch of weird protocols, proprietary stuff, and stuff that's really hard to handle. If you have a, a, a large installation, for example, you can't just say, okay, deploy all my boot orders for the BIOS settings. Um, are you going to address that in some unified, nice way where I can say, okay, I have this one protocol that runs on my um, Linux firmware that uh, does that nicely? That's exactly how it's, uh, most sites will deploy it, that they will write their own boot scripts that use uh, traditional, or excuse me, use normal protocols. So in the Mass Open Cloud, they are doing a, uh, a wget uh, over SSL that can then measure the received kernel uh, into the TPM and then k-exec it. And that's done uh, without requiring um, uh, changes to uh, NVRAM variables or all the sort of setup that you have to put into configuring a UEFI system that can be replaced with a, with a very small shell script. We have time for one last question, and this is from the Signal Angel, because the Internet has a question. Yes, Internet has uh, two very simple technical questions. Um, do you know if there's any progress, or do you know if any ATAs on the Talos 2 project? And are there any size concerns when writing firmware in Go? So the Talos 2 project is a power-based uh, system, and right now we're mostly focused on the x86 uh, servers, since that's the very mainstream available sorts of boards. And the Go firmware is actually quite small. Uh, I've mostly been working on the heads side, which is based on shell scripts. My understanding is that the, uh, the just-in-time compiled Go does not add more than a few hundred kilobytes uh, to the ROM image. Um, and only a few uh, hundred milliseconds to, to the boot time. The advantage of Go is that it is memory safe and it's a actual programming language. So it allows uh, the, the initialization scripts to be verified in a way that shell scripts can be very difficult to do. So thank you very much for answering all these questions. Please give a warm round of applause to Tramel Hudson. Thank you very much.